Mayor Sosko, who had to return to uh, the university yesterday to attend to his teaching duties. I am the next speaker, as well as the chairman here, so uh, I will begin with my, uh, my paper here. Need uh, the projectors on all. I think it's on the on the other side, Cal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some work that we've done at Research Triangle Institute on the deactivation of uh, platinum and plat uh, platinum alumina, as well as alumina supports for the de uh, the hydro dechlorination of 111 trichloroethane. This work is the uh, PhD research of Kevin Frankel, who is a graduate student doing his research at the Institute. Uh, myself, along with George Robertson, NC State, are his co-advisors. And the work is based on the PhD research of Ben Jang, now at RTI, uh, who did his uh, graduate work in this very area at the University of Texas Arlington. Right up front, I'd like to tell you the, uh, the acknowledge the funding for this work. The U.S. Army at, uh, at the Picatinny Arsenal and Army Research Office in the Research Triangle Park have funded this work. And we've worked closely with uh, Ben's advisor, Dick Timmons, at the University of Texas Arlington. Uh, the work is based on the need to dechlorinate certain compounds of military interest. We have focused on a very simple molecule here because we wanted to get a handle on the deactivation of these types of catalysts for the hydrotreating of a more general class of chlorocarbons that uh, the military is interested in. All the work that we're going to talk about today involves this single reaction of hydrogen with 111 trichloroethane in a helium diluent over a number of different catalysts. I'll talk both about platinum on various alumina supports as well as the alumina support because as we've studied them, we can see the effect of each on the deactivation and the activity of the reaction. I've shown down here the reaction that we're interested in more schematically, uh, 111 trichloroethane, I will call 111 TCA in the course of our discussion today, reacts with hydrogen to produce HCl and ethane as complete products. Now we also see in the course of this reaction, uh, incomplete reaction products, and I'm going to designate those by 11 DCE to mean 11 dichloroethylene, 11 DCA to mean 11 dichloroethane, and we also see others that are more familiar to chloroethane, vinyl chloride, and other compounds. Um, the reaction is very exothermic and thermodynamically favorable. Um, for that reason, we have carried out the reaction in a helium diluent that you'll see here. This configuration uh, of a segmented bed was suggested to us by uh, Professor John Butt, who spent some time with us at Research Triangle Institute trying to help us formulate a strategy for uh, developing uh, an understanding of the deactivation process. And in this type of system, what we do is feed hydrogen reactant and helium. The hydrogen to TCA ratio is 10 to 1. The balance is helium. We run at 250 degrees C, and all the experiments that I'll talk to you about today will run at this temperature. The purpose of this was to be able to follow the deactivation by a post-reaction analysis of each of the segments of the bed, looking at things like coke content, initial activity, uh, surface area, acidity, and basicity, and by looking at the way in which the deactivation wave makes its way down the bed and how those properties change, we could look at the deactivation process in a little more detail than we could otherwise. Um, I'm going to describe to you very briefly some of the physical properties of five different catalysts that we looked at initially. Those five catalysts are a commercial platinum on Ada alumina. This was made by Engelhard, a very high loading of platinum. Uh, we made the rest of these catalysts at RTI. We used an Ada delta alumina support with and without platinum and the properties that I've shown here except for the platinum dispersion are valid for, for whether the catalyst had platinum on them or not. We also look at an alpha alumina, low surface area alpha alumina as a, an inert 
uh, support, one in which we can support platinum and look at the role of platinum alone in this reaction as opposed to how the platinum and the alumina supports, the other two types of supports that we looked at, interacting. So these are the five catalysts that I'll, that I'll talk about today. You'll notice that, um, as expected, the alpha alumina is, is, uh, has no acidity or basicity and that the eta, the platinum or eta alumina is somewhat more acidic and basic than uh, the eta delta alumina. That's, uh, that's important as we look at this reaction later on. I apologize for the uh, difficulty some of you in the back may have in reading this, but what I have shown here is the results of a deactivation experiment in which TCA was fed to a segmented uh, reactor and as a function of time on stream, we monitor only the TCA conversion. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about the selectivity of the reaction because that's important too. But here I'm only looking at the disappearance of TCA from the inlet. You'll see here uh, some very interesting trends. Let's compare, for example, this curve, which is the alpha alumina. It's inert, as we expect, and the 3% platinum on that same support. You'll see that it, it begins with a fairly high initial activity, but deactivates very rapidly the uh, platinum on the alpha support. The other direct comparison that we can make with and without platinum is this one, and this is perhaps more interesting. This is the eta delta alumina, the support alone, as opposed to that same support with 3% platinum on it. And you'll see it's interesting that the platinum-containing catalyst actually deactivates by the, at least as measured by TCA conversion, more rapidly than the support alone. Now that was important to us in helping understand the deactivation process, and you'll see some, some other differences in how those two behave in a minute. But finally, the third or the fifth catalyst is the 3% platinum on eta delta, on eta alumina. This is the commercial catalyst. We have no direct comparison of that material on, uh, an, uh, with an eta alumina support on its own, but it is the most stable of the catalyst that we tested. And it will be one that uh, I'll focus on uh, as the talk goes on. Um, one of the things that we saw is that platinum is necessary for the complete dechlorination. By that I mean that in the absence of platinum on any of the supports, I have not shown all of the other supports that we tested here, but without platinum, um, the uh, ethane is not formed. And that is, again, as you might expect. On the eta delta alumina support, no hydrocarbons at all, and we see the removal of one chlorine atom. And this is consistent with the results of uh, um, Anderson and McConkie and Bozzelli and others who have studied uh, these types of hydrotreating reactions for chlorinated compound, and they have reported on, on uh, similar catalysts that the cleavage of the carbon chlorine bond occurs most uh, rapidly and first in a sequential reaction of the sort that we reported here. Uh, you can also compare, for example, this same support with platinum on it. We form ethane. We also see, however, some of the partially um, dechlorinated materials, both saturated and unsaturated. And finally, uh, if you compare this, where we are uh, to a first approximation, at least comparing the effect of the support, we see on this support some of the saturated uh, material, the DCA, that's the 1 1 dichloroethane, the saturated material, ends, uh, but we see none in the case of the eta alumina. I want to talk for a minute about the difference in selectivity. I showed you just a second ago the difference in conversion, the difference in the TCA conversion as a function of time. Um, if you look at the hydrocarbon selectivity on that same time scale, by hydrocarbon selectivity, I mean ethane or ethylene. We do see some ethylene in some cases, but this is almost always ethane. So this is the selectivity of those same catalysts for ethane, primarily ethane formation. I have not shown all of the catalysts here because uh, you recall from the previous slide not all of them made ethane. In the case of the eta delta alumina, of course, we see no uh, hydrocarbon selectivity at all. You remember, however, that this catalyst uh, lasted longer. It deactivated less rapidly than the platinum on that same support. However, the platinum on that same support has a high selectivity, high initial selectivity to ethane that gradually uh, decreases with time. And finally, you see here on the 3% platinum eta alumina that the hydrocarbon selectivity 
is initially high, but many times gradually decreases after a somewhat longer period of time. I want to look right now at the most stable of the catalysts that we examined, and that is the 3% platinum on eta alumina, and look, and look at how its properties change during the course of, the, of this reaction. I've shown here several properties that we measure. And recall that we segmented the bed. We have an inlet, a middle, and an outlet segment of the bed. Those segments were taken out and analyzed separately, and the properties that I report to, here, to you here are based on that segmented type of bed system. I've also shown here the fresh catalyst uh, for comparison. Of course, the fresh catalyst has no coat. You'll notice here that the coat loading is very high on these compounds. I'll show you later that um, where we look at other types of reactants, intermediates that uh, in the reaction where we fed DCE or DCA, for example, we do not see this type of coat formation. But the coat formation is very high. You'll also notice that this trend is consistent throughout the experiments that we ran that there is a decrease from inlet to outlet in coat content. It's gradual, but it's persistent and it's consistent in all the results. This suggests a parallel type of coating mechanism, and I'll show you a schematic of what we think is happening at the end of the talk. You'll also notice, again, as you might expect, that uh, if we take the fresh catalyst and in each of the segments and measure after the run the activity for the reaction to see how the rate constant has uh, decreased with time, there is a, uh, a decrease, of course, as you would expect in the fresh catalyst, the inlet being the lowest, the lowest reaction rate, and then it grab the rate gradually increasing with distance, again showing that the deactivation wave making its way from the inlet to the outlet. We also looked at the acidity and basicity, and, and recall that with this high uh, loading of coke, we're, we may of course be measuring not the acidity of the catalyst, but rather the acidity of the coke that's on the catalyst. But nevertheless, we see some interesting trends. We see that uh, we have divided the acidity by weak and strong. That is based on the TPD. Uh, results with ammonia where the weak sites are those at which uh, where ammonia is desorbed at low temperature, the strong sites those where ammonia is desorbed at higher temperature. Um, we see again an increase in acidity by this measure from the fresh catalyst and then a, a, if you will uh, agree a slight decrease in acidity with length. The basicity results are a little more striking. We see as we might expect that the HCl that's formed in the reaction is perhaps reacting with the base sites on the catalyst um, and we see very little weak acidity uh, or strong acidity we see a decrease from the initial uh, value that we, uh, that we saw. Um, now what, I've, what I want to talk about here for a second is experiments in which we took and compared uh, the experiments in which we fed TCA, looked at that, and then we fed the different reaction intermediates in the feed. So we're trying to probe the system to see which one of the intermediates is responsible for the change in properties and the deactivation. And what we see here, I've compared uh, the TCA results. These are the results that you saw earlier. We also fed TCA to the eta uh, delta uh, support alone. No, no platinum. We see uh, a much lower loading of coke and also this persistent decrease in coke as a function of reactor distance. These are the numbers that I showed on the previous table and for, for comparison I've shown them again. In these case we fed DCE, the unsaturated material with one chlorine atom removed, the saturated material, chloroethane and ethylene. And you'll see that in every case Except the case of ethylene, there is a uh, uh, slight but measurable decrease in co-content from inlet to outlet, again suggesting a parallel mechanism, and uh, a much lower loading of coke in any of these cases than with the 3% platinum on eight of them. I've, what I've done is plot here um, the results that, that you've seen in the last two slides, just to, to try to convince you that uh, there is, first of all, there is a relationship, as you might expect, between the coke content and the rate constants that we measure for the activity, as well as the fact that consistent with the early uh, 
work of uh, Fermat and others that this suggests a parallel coping mechanism. Here we see um, as a function of reactive length for the bed segment, the inlet, middle, and outlet, we've plotted code content and the relative rate constant, K over K0, and we see that um, a decrease in the code content with reactive length and an increase in the relative rate constant that, uh, that takes place in, in uh, conjunction with that. I want to look for a second at the role of the support. Now, what we did here was to take the eta delta aluminum and feed to it the TCA, the 111 TCA, as well as the reaction intermediates to look at the role of and a support that contained both acidity and basicity, but no platinum, no hydrogenation, dehydrogenation function. And look at the stability of that support with uh, these different feeds. You'll see uh, something that's very interesting, that it, the support itself only dechlorinates in the saturated chlorohydrocarbons. We see that in the case of DCA, the initial conversion is high and begins to drop off. DCA uh, is somewhat lower but deactivates rapidly. And in the case of DCE and ethylene, we see no conversion whatsoever and a small amount of conversion of um, chloroethane. This also is consistent with the work that uh, Ben Jang reported in his PhD work at the University of Texas Arlington. And, uh, also is consistent with the work reported by Weiss uh, back in the uh, 60s. Now, let's compare that to the case where uh, we take these same feeds, the TCA and then the reaction intermediates, DCA, DCE, and feed them to the platinum on a aluminum catalyst. In this case, we see that uh, unlike the results that we saw on, on the aluminum support earlier, the conversion of DCE and ethylene is uh, complete and does not deactivate with time. The TCA curve, uh, the conversion drops off with time. The DCA is com initially complete as well, drops off after a period of time. The chloroethylene, chloroethane rather, is uh, perhaps surprisingly constant. We see uh, moderate conversion but very little deactivation in that case. Now finally, I'd like to conclude uh, the talk by, by suggesting what we think is happening uh, conceptually. Um, Kevin uh, has, has begun to do some mathematical modeling of this, but I think the conceptual model is perhaps more interesting for our talk here. What we see is this. On the fresh uh, eta delta lumina support, we see deactivation, we believe, by poisoning. Recall that we see very little coke formation in this case, and we see conversion only to the uh, dichloroethylene, one chlorine removed. So this, this poison is formed as a result of that reaction, but no coke. However, on the uh, platinum, on the eta support or the eta delta lumina support, we see something quite different. In this case, we see both the poisoning, we believe, as well as coke formation, and in the case of the platinum eta aluminum, we saw up to 30-some percent coke loading. So the coke only forms when uh, the platinum is present. It's an interesting result. We know, of course, that platinum both is a, is a hydrogenation catalyst, but also, therefore, a dehydrogenation catalyst. It may be catalyzing that coke formation by its dehydrogenation uh, function. The last thing that I want to show you today is a uh, conceptual model that we have put together for the reaction of uh, TCA. Uh, we have also developed uh, a more complex model that accounts for some of the other reactants and even other temperatures at which we've run this reaction, but I think this is a, this is a very interesting result that we've seen. Let me walk you through it. We feed TCA. The P and the A refer to whether platinum or alumina are necessary for that reaction to take place. And then of course the arrows show whether this is a reversible process or not. What we see is that there is what we believe a very rapid and reversible adsorption of the TCA that requires and takes place on the platinum or alumina catalyst. This may be a poison, we don't know. 
this may be a poison, but we think that this reaction, of course, takes place very rapidly. Consistent with the results of uh, Bozelli, we see that the, uh, this species loses a chlorine atom. As I mentioned earlier, previous literature has shown that the breaking of that carbon chlorine bond is very rapid on these types of materials, and we see the same thing here. That chlorine then reacts with the hydrogen to produce the HCl. This requires, this takes place on the uh, platinum and aluminum catalyst and is irreversible. This forms an uh, unsaturated surface species that the star denotes that it's on the surface. And we believe this also is a poison, but this is the only way in which coke is formed from TCA. This reaction takes place very rapidly. This one, uh, this reaction, is, as I said, is irreversible and requires both the platinum and aluminum functions to take place. We do not see coke formation unless platinum is present on these catalysts. This uh, compound uh, reacts further, losing a hydrogen, again requiring the platinum alumina, and again being irreversible to an adsorbed dichloroethylene species. This, is, this species can then uh, react in multiple steps, which I've not shown here, to an adsorbed ethane, which is the final product uh, of the complete reaction. The adsorbed dichloroethylene DCE molecule can also be desorbed. You recall that we saw dichloroethene in, uh, as the catalyst began to deactivate. Um, it's interesting, I think, that when dichloroethylene is fed to the, uh, to the catalyst, we do not see coking. We do not see coking. Dichloroethylene does not produce coke. And you would expect, perhaps, as an unsaturated species, it might be more prone to form coke than the trichloroethylene. But, but feeding the DCE, we cannot get this way. This step is irreversible. We do not see coke being formed when this is, when this is fed. However, we do see conversion to ethane, and that requires only the platinum function. Only the platinum function. I haven't showed you those results, but when we test a platinum on the alpha alumina with the DCE as a feed, this is the product that we see, and therefore we say that platinum is all that is necessary for that part of the reaction to take place. Let me summarize what we've seen and conclude by saying that the, uh, of the catalysts that we have examined, the 3% platinum on eta alumina is the most stable that we've looked at so far. Uh, the eta delta alumina is only active for the dechlorination of the saturated hydrocarbons. The unsaturated materials do not react. Platinum is necessary for the complete dechlorination of TCA. Strong acidity and basicity of the uh, that catalyst are lost as, as the reaction progresses. Again, you might expect that as the coke at the levels that we've seen forms on, those, uh, on this type of catalyst. The, uh, this catalyst, 3% platinum eight alumina, is active not only for the uh, hydrogen chlorination of the TCA, but also its reaction intermediates. I showed you the results of where we fed uh, the reaction intermediates to that catalyst. The catalyst deactivates rapidly for uh, the hydrogen chlorination of both the saturated, the, the saturated TCA, as well as the 1,1 DCA, the saturated intermediate. Large quantities of coke are observed on the platinum eight alumina catalyst only when the TCA is the reactant. We do not see, we see some coke, but it is an order of magnitude less when other reactants are fed for comparable uh, periods of deactivation. And that's something that we're looking into uh, more now. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to entertain questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, it would seem from the species going to coke that you'd have even higher weight percent chloride than you do carbon. Did you measure the chloride on the catalyst? We did. We, we attempted to measure the chlorine on the catalyst with an ICPMS technique. Unfortunately, that technique relies on, on dissolving the chlorine in water. And we did do those analysis. It does show uh, chlorine, but very little. Uh, tenths of a weight percent. The chlorine that is reacted within the uh, coke itself 
we attempted to look at by XPS at the University of Texas Arlington. We don't have those results yet. But we would expect that the code would, inc uh, would include carbon, hydrogen, and fluorine as well, but we don't know yet. Terry, I, I was wondering if uh, you tried temperature programmed oxidation of the coal uh, and any other temperature program methods. Uh, it seems to me that you could get a lot of information from TPO, also TPSR with hydrogen. Right. And uh, maybe even TPD. Um, we did do the temperature program oxidation of the coal. I did not show those results today, but the Conditions we ran the coke begins to oxidize at about 350 or 400 degrees C. I have the, uh, the weight curves, and what we concluded from that was that um, the coke, at least by that measure, that's formed is very similar from catalyst to catalyst, and simply the amount that varies. Uh, when we, we did do some treatment in uh, hydrogen, but only to look at regeneration, I haven't showed those results today, but one thing that's very interesting is that we tried treating in helium and in hydrogen at slightly above the, at, or at, at the reaction temperature, 250 degrees C. No restoration of activity at all. When we treat at a higher temperature, at uh, 500 degrees C, it doesn't matter whether we use helium or hydrogen, both restore the activity. Uh, so we think that it is simply an ad, that's part of the rationale that went into the conceptual model showing the adsorbed surface species that they are easily, uh, or can be desorbed either in hydrogen or helium. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Yes, Ted. Can you ask a question? Okay, question. Can you show that the Exactly what's happening. The answer is no, we do not remove the metal before we did the, uh, the TPO experiments. That was simply a, we wanted to look at the reactivity of the carbon. And so it was, a, it was a comparative technique among the catalysts that we tested to see, for example, if the coke that was formed on the TCA was different than it was from DCE. Uh, it, it, for example, might it incorporate different levels of chlorine? Uh, we did not remove the metals. You're right, the gasification. Uh, reaction could well be catalyzed by the platinum, but we did not remove it. In the cases where we had 30-some uh, uh, weight percent of uh, coke on the catalyst, I'm not even sure the platinum would be accessible in those, at least initially. The coke contents that I reported were, were simply weight losses in a uh, controlled oxidation experiment. Um, and those were different from the experiments I described at Cal where we looked at the the temperature, we actually did TPO and looked at the temperature at which the coke was lost. Chris? Uh, just on the TPO experiment, depending on the type of step two you're using, you may well see a gel evolution at the same time as carbon evolution. That became maybe back to the carbon chloride. Right. We, we did an experiment in which we hooked a mass spec up to the TPO system and tried to detect HCl. And we just simply, the experimental technique just couldn't find it. Uh, doesn't mean it wasn't there, but it means that it was uh, the fragments from that were, were confounded with others, but we couldn't make the technique work. Jerry, your, uh, your results from the TPO and then the desorption in helium and hydrogen suggest that you have a hydro hydrocarbonaceous deposit, that, that uh, it's not just carbon, uh, right. or not a real heavy coke, but, but maybe some coke precursors or condensed pro, uh, coke precursors that are that can be absorbed at higher temperature. That's I, I think you're exactly right. And did you get a hydrogen to carbon ratio then from the TPO? No, no. That we simply carried that out. We we didn't measure what uh, came off in those regeneration experiments. We yeah. Did not measure the exit gas. We these are experiments that I was referring to here. Uh, you'll see that. We, we tested in helium and then in hydrogen after the catalyst had deactivated. Now this is on the support, we did the same sort of thing on the uh, platinum containing catalyst, but then when we treated in hydrogen or in helium, you see that the activity was restored. So you began to deactivate, we treated helium, we did the same sort of regeneration pattern in hydrogen or in helium. 
Yes, sir. What's really the same question? It's most likely soft coke, so it could be solubilized in organic solvent. Do you, do you try to dissolve your coke in uh, organic solvent? No, we didn't. And the, the reason is uh, that with these segmented beds are very small. And there's only a limited amount that we can do. And some techniques that we looked at for each segmented bed were destructive and some were non-destructive. Uh, the types of reaction or type of uh, experiment where we might dissolve it in methylene chloride, as was described in an earlier paper in this symposium, and look at uh, soluble versus insoluble coke, those sorts of things we'd like to do, but we didn't in them because the sample size is very limited, probably only 100 milligrams per segment. So we carried out repeated uh, identical experiments to create the sample inventory that we needed to do what I reported to you, but we haven't done the further characterization of the coke. 